Hey, this is Dan Lorenzo from the band Patriarchs in Black. Hope you check out my new album, Reach for the Scars. You're watching my buddy, John the Ninja. Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? It's John the Ninja live in the dojo, a.k.a. the Dojang, a.k.a. the John the Ninja Studios. And you know this, man. Today I have another New Jersey legend. What a blessing it is for me to have met so many wonderful, talented human beings. But this guy right here I have you is far none. He might be the best success story I've ever seen. But let's get to it. This gentleman in 1978 was in his classroom and he had this idea. He was in mythology class and he heard about Greek tales and he heard the word Hades. And in his head he went, you know what? That's a great band name. I'm going to do that. I'm going to be in a band called Hades. Now, here's the thing, though. He didn't have a guitar, and he didn't have a band. He just liked the music. But within that year, not only did he get that guitar, he started taking classes at his alma mater, and he started taking listening theory and music theory. And with the help of a great friend named Paul Smith, they made the band of the very name Hades. And Hades had a wonderful, wonderful career, especially since their resistance success is a cult classic and they opened up for Twisted Sister, my God. But after that, he found his sound. And what I mean by that, when he played, he was able to really relinquish himself to the guitar and found the sound he was looking for in the aftermath in another band, which happened to be called Nonfiction. So great a band. Not only did they tour America and the Europe scene, but Phil Ensemble himself caught this individual on a day they were just doing interviews and started singing their songs a cappella to him as loud as he could in a room full of people. I don't know about you guys. That's pretty damn cool to me. But as that band itself also ran its time. He took a short break in the early 2000s, came back, did the curse room full of sinners with the NJ legend, the thrash export, Bobby Blitz, who actually loves this guy's solo albums. He loves all his work. And he started getting back into the music scene again. He thought he was good not actually doing it, but he started other bands. Another one, Visual of Lights Project and Cassius King. But the band we're here to talk about today is Patriarchs in Black. The band he has created with the phenomenal heavy metal drummer and, may I say, typo negative drummer, Danzig drummer, and current quiet riot drummer, Johnny Kelly. Ooh, this gentleman who I speak of, ladies and gentlemen, is Dan Lorenzo. Him and Johnny Kelly have created Patriarchs in Black, and the best way to describe it to you is saying that it is literally a modern-day masterpiece that gives homage to heavy metal, but still has its own spin. And, as you know, I just spoke to Jim Florentine. He gave him a 5 out of 5 on Sirius Satellite Radio. This album is something that you cannot sleep on. Ladies and gentlemen, promoting this new, wonderful Search for the Scars Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dan Lorenzo of Patriarchs in Black. Sir, how you doing? I'm doing great, and I love that intro. You really did your homework. I appreciate it, sir. But man, it is, it's good to know that Jersey has so many legends, and you being one of them, you just have so many connections. But the first thing I got to ask, it's trivial. Yes, I know, but good, sir. What was your first guitar? My first guitar was called a Cameo, a Cameo SG. Man, I had to think of that. That's been so long ago, 1978, March of 78. Um, it was a cheap version of a Gibson SG. It looked real cool. Wasn't the easiest thing to play, but that was my first guitar. I got to give you credit because at Paramas, I believe that was the high school's name, you said you took the music lessons in theory and hearing. And I have a minor in music. I didn't even know I had the minor in music until years later and I needed the transcript. But I remember how difficult it was learning the theory, but mm -hmm. actually how much the hearing developed my ability to listen to songs. Oh, he's playing that or he's playing a form of that. Being the guitarist you are, you said you didn't really you didn't really find your sound until nonfiction. That's when you could say, OK, these are the types of riffs I like. These are the riffs I can do. But you never really liked that harder edge Sabbath sound or the bands that were heavier at the time. Not saying you didn't like them later, but what do you think it was that you were able to culminate heavier riffs, drop the tone once you had your own say in the band? Why do you think your ability is more staged towards 
that style of metal. Kind of like when Randy Rhodes popped in and said, hey, play Sabbath. He's like, what the hell is Sabbath? He was a classical guitarist, and now he's hailed as one of the, the big metal kings. Yeah, so for me, um, when I was in Hades, uh, I think I, you know, I loved thrash and I loved speed metal at the time for sure. And I still like it, but I was always playing a little bit over my head possibly because the drummer and uh, bass player, Tom Coombs and Jimmy Shulman, they liked Rush. They liked some progressive stuff, which I wasn't really a fan of. So I was trying to incorporate like a ton of riffs and make them happy. Like they weren't really into the simplicity that I was into. Um, I wanted everybody in Hades to tune down, but they thought their guitar necks would uh, warp or something like that. So we had a couple songs where we dropped the low E string. And then eventually the other guys like, oh man, we really they like dropping the tuning as well. But when Hades broke up, um, you know, like I've always been better at promoting and writing music than I have been at, like, I'm not a great lead guitar player. Um, I'm not a great guitar player and I can freely admit that, you know, I'm a competent, good guitar player who, when I play within my means, I'm, I'm very good at what I do. I don't make mistakes on stage. I have a real good ear, but I could no longer play along with uh hella weights, say by Slayer. Like maybe I would have however many years ago that was. So when I started nonfiction, I thought I thought to myself that this was just perfect for me. Um, I backed off the guitar solos. I cared much less about musicianship and I cared much more about the focus on the riffs. I wanted the drums and bass, you know, to accentuate my riffs, not kind of hide them. And you said something, you pretty much say you're not the most technical guitar player. <laughs> But there are guitarists, there's like so many levels to a musician, sure, you got the sure. appreciators, you got the people that are like the violinists that play really complex stuff, but they're not making it own and stuff. Do you still feel a need to try and practice and get better at any capacity? I'm not saying sit down and do the scales, but for me, you know, I agree. I'm not, I'm not going to be popping out no Kurt Hammett solos anytime soon but there are noodles and riffs if i hear a maiden yeah. song and i hear a harmony it's like you know what i just i gotta scratch that itch is there a particular form of practice that you still do that um it's more so like i want to do this than i have to do this it's funny you say that john because um i always tell people i've never practiced basketball i play basketball i don't practice guitar i play guitar so i have that what that's done is made me have my own style um, when I do say if there's a day I know I need to write um, a solo or record a solo for one of my, my songs, I actually will kind of practice. I'll mess around with a bunch of different uh, ad libs on my upstairs recording unit. And so that I guess that could be called practicing. I will practice. And sometimes when I practice lead guitar for like 20 minutes or half an hour, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm not that bad, actually. I'm getting pretty good. But in the summer, I don't I, I don't even play that much guitar in the summer. I'm always playing basketball or working. And um, in the winter, I kind of bear down, but I never pick up the guitar because I think I have to. I, I only pick it up because I want to. Indeed. So skipping a, a copious amount, I did want to question, because after nonfiction was done, you had a bunch of time in between before you and Bobby really hooked up and did, did the album. I was wondering what you were doing then, because I got stories you were contacted by the Howard Stern show, you were doing commercials for E, you were playing basketball. I, I wanted to know if that was professional, because we both share the three loves, metal, basketball. Really? You know, my heart. I know you're a Knicks fan. I'm a, I'm a Nets fan. I'm the second Nets fan. You've been right. talking to, but uh, I was wondering, what were you doing during that downtime before you really got back into music to the capacity where you're at now. Cause you did take not like a full break, but you were, you were on a different level. Like even now your job is you work. For, I don't believe it's a tattoo company, but you do advertising for, for we, an no, we, we sell tattoo supplies. I work for a company out of Maryland from my home in New Jersey. And I like tomorrow I'm flying to Dallas to a convention. But what I did in 1994 is I fell in love with my, what became my wife, Gina. And um, at the time I remember thinking, you know, I can't go on tour anymore because I'm going to be married. I want to be faithful to Gina. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. Um, what am I going to do on tour if I'm not, you know, trying to hook up with women, which I did when I was single. Um, so I decided I kind of sold all my equipment because I just I think I wanted to prove to myself that if I was going to be a husband, I was going to be all in. I wasn't going to be like the guy who goes on the road and cheats on his wife. I was going to be, you know, be a good husband. So 
um, I actually sold my guitar and I didn't play guitar for two years. I just, we said I started playing basketball and fell in love with the game of basketball as well. So we have to go back because you mentioned the misses and, and I love how you're always respective towards her in interviews. Guys will ask, what's the craziest stories you got? Well, we got some, but I can't mention I'm a married man. And that, that falls short on a lot of people of how much respect you have for your wife, not putting out that laundry, even yeah. though you probably didn't know her. I got to ask, how did you guys meet the Pope? Was it when you guys got married in Rome or yeah. it just, uh, come on, I got to hear that story. That's one. So we, we flew to Italy to get married on, uh, I believe it was a Thursday. We met with the priest on Friday because we were going to get married on Saturday. And he said, while you're here, do you want anything? I said, yeah, I'd like to get a couple of tickets to see the Pope, just being obnoxious and silly. <laughs> and they said, okay, how about Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock? So um, we actually, it was that easy just because we got married in an English speaking church, which is what you have to do legally to uh, make the marriage legal. Um, the priest had connections. I guess they all have connections in Rome probably. And he got us two tickets to sit at St. Peter's and uh, sit right next to the Pope during the morning mass in, uh, in St. Peter's. And uh, next thing you know, I'm on stage going past the Swiss guards and my wife and I are sitting next to the Pope while he's giving mass. And there was like a dozen other newly married couples, but it was pretty surreal. I don't care if you're religious or not. That's a universal, hey, you got this. This is good stuff. But it it is cool how you you are straight edge. Again, love your wife. You guys have been together. Were you always straight edge when you first started performing and going out touring? not using not drinking or was it more of a conscious decision like i don't want this to affect who i am as a person or i don't want this to affect my playing because we all hear the stories of like going overboard and something falling apart yeah i think if you're going to really call yourself straight edge you can't ever have a drink and my wife and i will go to key west and because we're not driving we might have a drink a couple of nights in a row even so I, i don't really use the term straight edge um I just, you know, the worst drug I ever did in my life was pot. I smoked a little pot back in the, uh, I guess, the 80s and the early 90s. Haven't smoked it since then. Um, so I know real true straight edge people don't like people like me calling themselves straight edge and then having a drink in Key West. So whatever I am, you know, whatever that is, straight edge 95% of the time or 99% of the time. How did you beat Bobby Blitz? Because again, I already mentioned another NJ legend, but he seems so pivotal to everything you're doing now. He's such an important figure in thrash as a genre. Overkill will always be top five among the greats. And I don't care what anybody says. I know they have Metallica, they have Megadeth and all that. But to me, true thrash is ingrained in what Overkill does, what Death Angel does, Exodus, staying true to it, Testament as well. You know, how did you guys meet and what was the bond like? Was it headed off right then and there? Or he was just so infatuated with your work. You were like, wow, that's pretty cool. No, if, if I remember the story correctly, uh, the original version of Hades opened up for Overkill at the Union Jack, probably around 1982 or 83. And Overkill were taking too long on their, on their sound check. And I put my hands on the stage. Hey, when the hell are you guys going to get off? And I'm looking around and Blitz purposely stepped on my finger he says i don't know if i remember that exactly but i do remember having a little war of words with rat skates a few weeks later but um and then i you know hades would open up for overkill and i don't remember really talking to blitz much really that around that time and then when nonfiction came out um blitz and Dee, Dee really liked nonfiction, and we were fortunate enough where they brought us on uh american tour and because we were both Knicks fans, or all three of us at the time were big Knicks fans, um, you know, back then there was no cell phones, there was there was no internet. Um, so I would have my record label, IRS Records, when we were touring Europe, it was during May and June, um, they would fax me the, um, the, the sports pages of the Daily News and the New York Post so I could read about what was going on with the Knicks. And um, Dee Dee and Blitz, or after I was done reading it, I would give it to Dee Dee and Blitz. And we just kind of bonded it over the Knicks. Blitz and I hung out. I remember one time we, uh, I think we were the original wedding crashers at a wedding in Holland one time on the North Sea. And uh, we just became, you know, friendly then, the 93 tour of Europe. And then when I released my first solo album in 2003, Blitz really dug it. And he told me, 
you know, this is the music I work out to. He's like, I want to sing a song on your next solo album. I'm like, all right. So we did that. And then in 2007, um, you know, I'm always sending, I was always sending Blitz on my songs, my riffs or whatever. And he's like, all right, now it's time. Let's do an album together. So we did The Cursed Room Full of Sinners and uh, great album, you know, really great album. We only played one live show. So the record kind of is an underground classic, but um, Blitz will go on, you know, Sirius XM and talk about his favorite guitar players. And he drops my name up there, you know, says I'm like his favorite guitar player. So that's, that's always nice. You know, uh, I respect him a lot and we're friendly on top of, you know, being former business partners or whatever you want to call it. And I love how it started from pretty much you guys fighting. Yeah. Uh, it's something about the beauty of music and sports just like man what the hell you take it too long and then all of a sudden you guys are you you find out you have the similarities and i believe music is like it's sometimes sports sports is a little bit more hostile but that's the the avenues like no matter where you're from you can always come together but again it is so fascinating that you have the support of him and all these other bands you have two other bands we're going to get to as well but i want to hop to uh to patriarchs in black because this new album search for the scars it truly did hit me as of like that's different i like that and considering that you have these other bands would it be right to say that johnny really completes your sound for the the metal styling of riff you have because every every drummer has a different feel but you said when you, when you came in you laid the tracks down you sent it to him usually you let the drummers do their thing. Hey, man, if, you know, you feel this way. Let's try it out. Let's feel it. But Johnny, being the competent musician and is being a, a very pivotal sound in that metal genre, he laid it down and you're just like, oh, shoot. OK, we're good. Yeah, let's keep going. Would you say that he's kind of a, a very like um, a missing piece to some of the writing you've been doing? Um. I love Johnny. I don't want to give any disrespect to Ron Lipnicki, who played on the last Hades album that he played for Overkill for 10 years. And Ron played for Vessel of Light and he still plays for Cassius King. Very different styles. Um, probably between you and I, Johnny might be more perfect for my style because sometimes I'm a less is more player. Um, so I think Johnny is perfect for the riffs. Um, and he also helped arrange a couple of the songs, but He's a great guy. He's always happy. He's the consummate professional. He's always working. And it's 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 nice to be around a guy like that, you know, who's I love people who are always happy. I mean, I know there's a lot of things in the world we could all get upset about, but just the fact that Johnny is always upbeat, which is kind of the way I am. Um, you know, like I said, there's things that suck in the world, but personally, my my life is super close to perfect, you know. Um, and even though I write angry, heavy music, it's I really appreciate Johnny's attitude towards everything. It's he has such a great attitude, um, and he's a monster player, you know. And yeah, Patriarchs in Black. The album's actually called Reach for the Scars, and like you said, Carl Agil sings a couple songs. Dewey Bragg from Kill Devil Hill. Jimmy Necco sings uh, Cashmere, the only cover song on the album. But it's getting really, really good reviews, and I definitely want to do another album by Patriarchs in Black. And one thing you did touch on, you guys did do Cashmere. You brought up that, you know, the longer songs aren't really your thing. It's good for some people, but you like the old school 70s radio format, three minute hit, catchy, stucks with you, out. So when the guys were going back and forth on what Zeppelin covered to do and you agreed to Cashmere, I thought that was like, well, you know what, that's a longer song. Did you have any reservations about that or you were kind of like, you know what? It's it's not like it's going to be a make or break. I can I can stick this one out for an eight minute song as opposed to the three four minute songs you guys yeah. are doing. Well, it's funny because a lot of people will say to me, "Hey, you don't do enough guitar solos. We, there's no guitar solo on Cashmere. It's an amazing song, and we also uh, covered Immigrant Song. We have Jimmy Necco hasn't sang it yet, but we're going to be doing that. And that's another Led Zeppelin song without a guitar solo. So it's I kind of think to myself, it's kind of funny." We picked a couple songs with no guitar solos. But yeah, some people were like, what made you pick that? I'm like, they're like, everybody covers that. And when I Googled it, I only found like a live version of Alice in Chains, a live version of some orchestra. I didn't really find studio versions of Cashmere. So I'm really happy with it. And um, Jimmy Necco sang the hell out of it, obviously. And he's like you said, he's 
not really well known in the metal world, but he's a big time singer. He's been on stage with Slash and Duff, played with Stone Temple Pilots. He's done a lot of big, big stuff. And I mean, to have him sing on the record was an honor, even though he's a lot younger than me. I have a lot of respect for Jimmy because he's the real deal. Um, but yeah, I, I know it was a kind of a weird choice, but fortunately, people seem to really dig it. And you guys have so many other songs that are just monstrous. Let me run through the set list real quick. Um, the Dog, Sing for the Devil, The Submission Bell, Build a Misery, This Damn War. We're going to get to that one in just a moment. Morning, This Life, Demon of Regret, and Cashmere. For me, the song that I liked the most was, it was definitely Morning, This Life. Okay. And I feel like it had a different riff style. Not as aggressive. It was definitely, it was apart from the rest of the songs on the album. It stuck out to me. I was wondering, did you feel that when you first wrote it and said, you know what, this still has a place in the album? What yeah. What you thinking with it? Yeah, I thought it was a little different. And when I look back, it was almost like maybe like a picture Dave Grohl could have written that riff, you know, and most of my riffs aren't like that. But um, yeah, it was a little more up tempo. But I mean, I don't think too much. I write so many songs throughout the course of a year. I'll write the music to like 30 songs. So I don't spend hours or too much time thinking about, oh, what does this song represent? I just write, you know, and I give them to people if they like them. If Johnny didn't record it, it wouldn't have been on the album. Like there's a couple of songs Johnny didn't get around to playing drums with, but I just write so much. I don't give any one song too much thought. I just write. So what would be the determining factor of what goes on the album? Is it like, hey, group decision? Because it is, no. in reality, it's between you two. I know... Carl's a very big integral part, especially with the music he's done and the contributions, but it's it's you two back and forth. How do you two decide this would be good to put on wax? So I do something very odd, which I don't think a lot of guitar players do is, um, John, I record the whole album, the whole, you know, everything, all the guitars before there's any drums. I play along with the click track and then I give the songs to Johnny. So if Johnny decides I don't like this song or I don't feel this riff or I don't can't think of drums for this song then it's not going to be on the album because he's not going to record it so I, I literally can record seven or eight songs Johnny will start recording drums then we'll hand them out to the singers if they think of a melody line we're going to go for it you know there was one song that Johnny and I recorded that Carl hasn't finished his melody lines and lyrics to quite yet even though I gave it to him six months ago so that'll be on the next album you know you don't want to overthink it even though like you said, we both studied some music theory and harmony um, in Primus High School. I did that for two years. It was the only class I got straight A's on. But um, they always say you have to learn the rules before you can break the rules. And I'm not breaking any rules. I just don't like to think too much about all the theory I learned. You know, I don't want it to mess me up. I give you a lot of credit because I got beat. I got beat senseless in music theory. Oh, yeah? It wasn't even funny. I, I But I do understand what you mean by that because as soon as it started being implemented all the stuff i was doing on guitar it made sense to yeah. that so basically i knew the answer i didn't know the problem it really did for me john is um my ear just developed so much from the beginning of 11th grade to the end of 12th grade like i went from loving kiss to hating kiss <laughs> before i knew that you know when i first started playing guitar i didn't know that they tuned the e flat so like years go by you know, I couldn't figure out Kiss songs. Then I learned music theory and harmony. And then I'm like, ah, no, let me go back to some old Kiss. And I heard it so differently. And I'm like, oh my God. And I started jamming along with it. And I, and I re-fell in love with Kiss. But um, it's just so funny how when your ear isn't developed, like sometimes like, like my wife, she doesn't have a good ear and she can talk to me about music. Her opinion is valid, but there's some things like I roll my eyes and she's like, oh, that song sounds like this. I'm like, oh my God, it sound, sounds nothing like that. But you know, there's, they, they taught me in high school, there's two ways to look at music, um, cognitively and emotionally. Cognitively, I can say, this is a fact, this song is in the key of C minor, but I can't tell you if it's a good song or a bad song. Factually, I can only tell you emotionally, I think this is a great song. You think this is a bad song. We're both right when it's based on emotion. Speaking of emotion, I wanted to hop on to this damn war. Because when you were initially writing that song, there's a lot of factors that came into it. You were, you're a big history buff. That's the other thing we share. We love history. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you have the Abraham Lincoln tattoo. Yep. And initially, it was going to be a Civil War piece. And it just so happened yeah. at the same time, Ukraine had its war breakout with Russia. Yeah. And it just, it was a perfect time, perfect representation. But I was curious, when you were writing it with the Civil War idea, 
what is it about the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln, especially to get a tattoo of him, that resonates with you? I was just down south for a wedding and going to the Civil War Museum, seeing the passion on both sides, the Confederates and the Union, and seeing how much divide there was. It, it really brought me to like, wow, we're still in that same sense of divide, except yeah. now we're not killing each other over it every day. There's more respect. There's a little bit more camaraderie of going back and forth, even though it can be hostile. What did the war and music mean to you? And how do you feel it translates for people that are in that Ukraine situation where Russia is taking over and they have to fight back? Well, there's similarities in the two wars. Um, so let's just say you and I were brothers. And, you know, we we're born in uh, 1850, whatever year it is, 1845. And uh, you move up to uh, Maine and I move down to Georgia. We could have literally been fighting each other, even though we were brothers, you know. Um, and the same things happen in the Ukrainian war, where there's Russians who left Russia to go to Ukraine and, and parts of a family were dispersed from Russia to Ukraine. So it's basically the concept of brother fighting brother. It seems so hard to imagine if you really think about it in that context, like how could you let it get that bad? Um, you know, war is so stupid. Like I really do believe that more people on this planet have similarities than differences. I do blame the media for trying to drive a wedge between us and, and you know, CNN wants us to hate every Republican and Fox News wants us to hate the Democrats. And I hate that shit. I mean, you know, whether you like the Nets or the Knicks, what do I care? I mean, as long as you don't bother me, I, it doesn't matter to me. You know, if you have a different God than I have, it, it doesn't matter. Just treat people with respect. But I just thought it was such a fascinating time in American history and how, you know, we could have literally gone. It could have been like a North Korea, South Korea, you know, North America and South America. Just amazing how close it came to uh, dividing America forever. And um I just, it's such a fascinating time in American history. And I, I, I find Abraham Lincoln, you know, his growth as a human being going from sort of tolerating slavery to being, you know, abhorred by it. Um, and, and when you think about it now, like slavery, like how can you, like there's like, you know, Jefferson Davis, he went to church, man, but he thought it was okay to have slaves and whip them and tell them and, you know, what to do and not pay them and own them. It's just, it's mind blowing a couple hundred years later when you see what they went through. It's, it's, you know, and I'm not like a crying liberal, but it, it just blows my mind that I lived on the same planet in the same continent as people who thought slavery was acceptable and they would still go to church. It just cracks me up a little bit, you know? That was a big thing for Stonewall Jackson. I went to go visit his office in Winchester and the, we, it was a great, we had guys from Jersey and DC and all these, it was just my day, all these professors in history were there to visit. I right. was the only one that wasn't well-versed in Stonewall Jackson's history, but over and over again, he was so devout as a Christian mm -hmm. that they put in, but he also was a slave owner, yeah. and this and that. So thinking of Demon Regret, you guys, you guys had a great tune, and then Carl comes in and just comes up with this harmony that is just out of this world. You guys love it. And it, I would say it's pretty safe to say, if you guys do tour, he would be the one you guys would take on that full length tour. I've seen him live with Corrosion. Blew me away. And it it's something where you really can't pinpoint what he's got. He's got this edge to him musically. When you first heard him say it, you guys praised him on it. You guys, you know, have said it's great. We all know it's great, but take me back to the first time you heard that harmony when he laid the track down and that feeling of, oh, that's good. Yeah, I think it was December and it was, um, I sent him the song, which was called Lamb at the time. Whenever I write a song, I just put these temporary titles that mean absolutely nothing. I don't even know why I called it Lamb. I don't remember why, but, um, you know, Johnny had done the drums to it and Carl was starting to sing it and Dave from Doggy Dog play, eventually played bass on it. Johnny and I both had the idea at the same time, like, why don't we have a couple different singers? We'll send a couple different singers, a couple different songs. And when we got back Demon of Regret from Carl, I just remember thinking like, damn, man, we should have asked him to do every song on the album. It's so good. He's so perfect for us. But then I did get the other songs back from the singers and I was equally as, as ecstatic as I was with Carl. But yeah, Johnny and I were just like, wow. I remember Johnny saying, yeah, Carl hit it out of the park. You know, he just crushed it. So we were really happy. And then um, Carl loves the band so much. Um, one of the reasons I would pick him to go on tour with is because he's the one who wants to do it the most. 
Um, and I've heard people say John Costco, who sings on two of the songs, uh, Sing for the Devil and This Damn War, um, that John could probably sing all the songs. But John and Carl, that's why I had them do a, a song together on This Damn War. They, John's a huge fan of uh, Carl, and Carl really likes what John did on the album. So um, either one of them, they could both come out with us and both sing. I think that'd be really fun, you know, but um, it's really hard right now because Johnny's with Quiet Riot every weekend. He's playing pretty much two or three shows a weekend with Quiet Riot. Like I'm flying to Dallas tomorrow night. I'm going to be there for four days. And I won't even see Johnny because he's going to be literally flying back to Dallas from Quiet Riot dates when I fly home. So he's incredibly busy, as you said earlier. But to get back to your initial question, as soon as Carl sang Demon of Regret, I knew that was the first single. We were super stoked. And just the list of some of the other guys we didn't get to mention. I'm going to butcher some names, but Dave Neobor from Dog Eat Dog. We got Eric J. Morgan from A Pale Name, I'm sorry, A Pale Horse Named Death. Right. John Costco, you already mentioned, Rob Trainer, Mr. Bragg from Kill the Devil Hill. You guys had four offers for a record deal before you guys even had the album recorded. You had the single ready to go. And in a day and age where it's so difficult to get a deal, not just in the States, you know, not thinking Sony and platinum, all that craziness, right, right. but just anywhere, you know, they go, Hey, we will take care of you and we will give you a good deal. What were some of the things you were looking for having been in that position before, as far as wanting to promote the band, as far as payment, what were the key factors that made you go with the guys that you picked? I believe it was MDD records in Germany. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a fortune, but it was a little more money than the other guys. But it was really important to me that the label was big fans of a lot of my music. Um, the guy that, uh, who owns the label, he actually has like all my albums. So that was nice that he knew uh, my history. That was kind of cool. And they, you know, they told us they would do a lot of advertising, which they've done. They were really persistent. Um, and I'm really happy we chose them. And they did do a good job. One of the PR firms that major, major names always come through. We're promoting you guys. Like I said, you guys were talked to, talked about by Jim Florentine. I don't know if you know him personally. I just got done talking to him not too long ago. Wonderful guy, but knows his metal. And he doesn't pull punches. See, if he likes it, he likes it. If he doesn't, he going to let you know. What, what would you say for Patriarchs is the overall biggest goal? Because again, you have these other bands. You have King and you have Light. And it seems that you're, you're on Johnny's trajectory of doing a bunch of things here and there and keeping your hands going. That's not uncommon for musicians, but for this particular project, what is the end game for the current situation? Do you want to just have the album go gold and then keep releasing <laughs> albums? Do you want to legitimately like, hey, as soon as you slow down, we're quiet, right, we got to go on tour. What are some of the goals for the future? And just to add on, you guys already have music set for the next album. How long of a turnaround before we get that music as well? Well, I just wrote my first eight minute song for the next album a few weeks ago. Um, the goal was just to sell enough records that the label would say, hey, we want to do another record. And thank God that's already happened. So just to do another album, to keep being able to find a label that will pay for the mix in the studio and pay for the CDs and the vinyl and all that and the distribution. Um, you know, I'm, I love laying out money for my projects because my music is my baby. So I'll lay out some money out of my pocket, but just to have a label on my team, there's no way we're ever going to go gold in the way the world is now. Um, and like I said, it is difficult to tour with Johnny and Quiet Riot. So just the fact that we're going to be able to do another record, I'm psyched about that. Has anybody reached out to you yet as far as the community that took your breath away? Again, you guys know so many people that people like me were just going to be starstruck. I was starstruck seeing you on video. I'm like, oh my God, you know, but who who's really reached out and made a comment that really is like, you know what, that's more than validating. That has humbled me other than Bobby or you yeah. know, the guys and whatnot. Other than Blitz, it's a good question. I'm sure there's somebody just, I mean, just the magazine reviews have been phenomenal, but nobody like uh, Slash or whatever. Maybe I got to ask Jimmy Necco if he sent Slash uh cashmere yet i i don't have an answer for that question unfortunately mr ninja you're almost 60 and now you're saying this is the the busiest you've been the most fun you've had and you're just inspired to keep going what what is it about the music for you that keeps you young what what would you say is that that part of that everlasting water that you continue to do this 
You know, I guess a, a mature adult probably wouldn't release and record and write music unless he was making money doing it because the amount of time and money I spend, it doesn't come back to me. It's just, it's just like, you know, when I play basketball, um, people try and tell me what to do on the court, how to work a pick and roll. And I literally, I can't listen to what they're saying. Like baseball, I understand. Basketball is over my head. When I'm playing basketball, I'm having so much fun. I'm back in the fifth grade playing kickball. When you don't have a job, there's no chance you're ever going to kiss a girl. You know, it's just, you're just <laughs> playing sports. So when I play music, when I'm recording and jamming with my guys, it's co- sort of brings me back to that feeling you have in fifth grade where the outside world doesn't matter right now. I'm having immense fun doing this thing. It's bringing me great joy. And it puts me back to being, you know, maybe listening to Kiss when I was in the eighth grade in 1977 or whatever. Now we got to go for a speed round. But I, I am ready for the lightning round. All right, good, sir. So you said you are not an Ozzy fan, but you're a Dio fan. What's your favorite Sabbath Dio song? Hey, Lady Evil is up there. Oh, that's a great one. Uh, Heaven and Hell, the song, of course. And, um, you know, we did Voodoo. Um, right, be- right after Dio died, uh, Hades played a show in Germany in 2010. And everybody was asked to do a Dio song. And we did a, a Dio, you know, whether it was Sabbath or whatever. We did Voodoo. And Voodoo is always a special song for me. Um, there's a great video of Hades playing the Bang Your Head Festival in 2010 in Germany playing Voodoo. So that's that's up there for sure. Favorite ACDC song. And it has to be off of Highway to Hell. Highway to Hell is the most perfect album ever recorded. I'm going to go with touch too much or beaten around the bush, but I could pull any song from highway to hell. I mean, that's just perfection to me. I gotta, I gotta go love hungry man. It's not their yeah, style. Great one. The, great. the bass, the bass is like, yeah. What about maiden? I like the Paul Diano stuff, but I don't listen to that anymore. I was really big on that in the early Hades. We did a lot of tons of maiden first four or five albums, but um, I haven't found myself listening to Maiden in many, many years. It didn't age well for me. I'm not a Dickinson guy at all. Okay. And the last one, Kiss. Kiss. Favorite album is Rock and Roll Over. Favorite song. Maybe I, I Want You or Love uh, Love Him and Leave Him or Calling Dr. Love, but again, just about a perfect album. Awesome. Good, sir. I always end these with the most important question. What's the best piece of advice someone has given you? Something that... It always pops in your head. It always comes through. You didn't derive it from your own teachings or learnings, but somebody said it to you and it just, you know what? It could have been funny, could have been really, really important at the time, but something that has stuck with you on your journey. Well, my father gave me contradictory advice to every everybody else's father. My father, and, and this is probably bad advice, my father told me, put all your eggs in one basket. Be the best in the world at one thing and you'll always make a living. Like, like I still, if something breaks in my house, I don't know how to fix it. It's embarrassing. Like I have to call somebody, but I, fortunately I can afford to usually have people fix things, but um, just being the best in the world at one thing. And for me on a personal level, this is my advice to young people is do what you love. And if there's a job, if there's two jobs, like you shouldn't take a job that pays 10% more. It doesn't matter. You know, find something that you actually don't hate because going through your life with a job you hate, I, I can't imagine that. You know, I mean, to me, every day is fun. I'm a baby. You know, if it's not fun, I'm going to walk away. Um, I like to have fun. And and you can find a job that you actually love and is rewarding and is actually entertaining. And, you know, I believe it's out there. I, I don't like when people settle in life. So that's my own advice I threw in there. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Lorenzo of Patriarchs in black go check them out guys they're on amazon more importantly buy their stuff on bandcamp spotify go stream them and definitely go check them out on instagram with the same name sir thank you so much i'm truly honored i was flabbergasted i couldn't speak english oh stop it you did great thanks so much john thank you and guys as always be smart be mindful and rock on you know what i'm gonna say ninja out You listen to John the Ninja. All your ears are about to go on a vacation. John the Ninja's got what you need.